the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Desiree, please join us with Kate. Would you, you prefer the pulpit? Or, yeah, come on up then. You got it. And then just adjust, of course, that accordingly. I wore my heels. Oh, you wore your heels. I wore there my heels. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, good morning. So I bring greetings from the community of Rahab sisters who have been nourished by your hospitality over the years and continue to be fed with your generosity. And as it, it is your steadfastness in these pandemic times that is especially significant in the midst of great need everywhere. And as Father Tom said, my name is Desiree. My name is Desiree Eden Ocampo, and I'm the executive director of Rahab Sisters. And all that really means is that I work for a small, dedicated, and compassionate team to serve people on the margins. And not just any people, but in particular, women and genderqueer, non-binary, non-conforming, and trans human beings being marginalized by poverty houselessness, sex work, violence, and substance use. Now, my history with Rob sisters pales in comparison to the years the Church of the Good Shepherd has had. I started just a year ago, while you have had years of faithful service, being present in friendship, preparing meals for delicious homemade dinners, setting up mother's tea, sending financial support to sustain the work and lifting us up in prayer. I want to share a little bit about myself this morning before I get into the Hebrews passage. I received a Master's of Divinity degree some 15 years ago after feeling called to full-time ministry. But don't worry, it isn't that $50 online degree kind that anyone can get that Father Tom mentioned. <laughs> I studied at Fuller Theological Seminary um, in Pasadena, California. And currently I am under care for ordination as Minister of Word and Sacrament in the Cascades Presbytery for the Presbyterian Church USA. And as Father Tom mentioned, you get to go through a whole lot of hoops and you get to go through a whole lot of people who tell you whether you're fit for the job, have the right training, whether you know enough, or if you have the stamina for pastoral ministry. But I'm not going to bore you with my ordination journey, so I'll just fast forward to a year ago when God firmly called and placed me smack down the middle of 82nd avenue on a busy highly active and colorful highway that goes through portland's east side and the entire length of multnomah county and so i find myself in the backyard of saints peter and paul episcopal church home of rahab sisters for the past 19 years it was a cool evening july evening and it was my first time at a Friday night gathering. I was checking out what community through radical hospitality looked like. And I knew that many organizations espouse practic uh, practicing radical hospitality, but often it comes with plenty of expectations and conditions stated or otherwise. Now I recalled wondering, I recall wondering that evening if what I saw and the energy I found were the same things that the spies whom Joshua, son of Nun, sent to Jericho saw and felt when they entered Rahab's house. Women in the margins and at the edge of the city, supporting each other out of necessity for survival. Women who make a living in the ways they know how, while finding sanctuary without condemnation. Did they find, as I did, a community of hope to be together, safe in each other's company, if only for a time, before they go back to face the harsh realities life has afforded them? 
comforted in the knowledge that they can be just as they are, yet be loved for the person they are underneath the layers of invisible armor they've put on over the years. Well, I found a community where, where differentiating between who the quote-unquote receiver of charity were from those providing them was a challenge. And so as I engaged with a couple of guests asking if I could bring them something to drink, they beamed and invited me to sit and have dinner with them. And there I was checking out to see how they serve people. And then I found myself being the one being served. And the line between giver and receiver was blurred. And they thought of Jesus in the parable recorded in, the Ma in Matthew's gospel saying, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. And there was mutual mutuality. There was a kind of sharing that required the risk of self to a stranger for the hope and the already fulfilled promise of friendship and community. And as God's beloved people, redeemed by the blood of, the, of Jesus the Christ, our one true friend, we are called into community with each other in mutual love. So the Hebrews epistle urges its readers in verse 1 to let mutual love continue. But then the author immediately follows it up with an exhortation to not neglect the giving of hospitality to strangers. And I like that word neglect, as opposed to other English translations of the original Greek where they use the word forget. Do not forget to extend hospitality to strangers versus do not neglect to extend hospitality to strangers. Do not forget makes hospitality sound like something you pick up from the grocery store on your way home from work. Don't forget to pick up some eggs. Well, it's nice to have eggs for breakfast. It isn't necessary to have. In fact, we can live our whole lives not ever eating eggs and be just fine. And I see, see some of you vegans out there nodding. I see you. Extending hospitality to strangers. It's not like eggs. I'm suggesting that the new Revised Standard Version Committee of Translators who decided that instead of saying, do not forget to extend hospitality to strangers, but instead, do not neglect to extend hospitality to strangers, believe that hospitality is a given. That hospitality naturally exists in the church that we are called to hospitality from the moment we were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Being told not to neglect something implies a prior expectation of continuing action. Like, don't neglect your garden. There's an expectation that it will be tended to, otherwise it will die. Like, doctors, don't neglect your patients. Or parents, don't neglect your children. So the Hebrew author says, church, don't neglect hospitality to strangers. Don't abandon hospitality to strangers. Don't fail to look after your hospitality to strangers. Don't abandon it. Hospitality to strangers is the way we love one another as Jesus loves us. Now, I'm a bit of a language nerd, and I find the phrase hospitality to strangers just a little bit awkward, don't you think? Like, if I were truly hospitable, my hospitality wouldn't stop with my own family and friends, would it? Could I really call it hospitality if I limited it to only the people I know and trust? I mean, the dictionary defines hospitality as the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. 
hospitality assumes a stranger. Yet in reality, we think of hospitality as entertaining our own friends, setting our finest table for our finest friends. And I think this is where the English language fails us. Because the original Greek word that we translate as the phrase hospitality to strangers is philoxenia. It is a compound word that when combined is actually oxymoronic. Philosenia or philosenos are the word philos and senos. Philos as in friend. Senos as in stranger or foreigner or alien. The Greek word for hospitality, philosenia, literally translates as friend stranger. Two contradicting things coming together as one. How can a friend be a stranger and how can a stranger be a friend? If that's truly what hospitality is, friend stranger. The writer says, let mutual love continue. Mi epilantenesti, do not neglect. Tes philosenias, hospitality. Do not neglect to practice friend stranger. Friend stranger. I love that sound. It's a beautiful image for hospitality, I think. Can you imagine going about your day and for each encounter you have with another human being, you think to yourself, friend stranger. I am their friend and they are my friend. I am their friend stranger and they're my friend stranger. Or I am their friend though they are stranger to me and they are my friend though I am stranger to them. It changes our perspective of hospitality once we become mindful that hospitality, hospitality requires both friend and stranger. So when the Hebrews author writes of mutual love continuing, it isn't limited to love for just within the church whom we know and call our friends. It is through, the, through hospitality, which is love for strangers, foreigners, and aliens, who we are on, who are on their way to being our friends so long as we open ourselves to them in love. But why does the Hebrews writer talk about hospita hospitality, then quickly move on to the criminal justice system, then to sex and marriage, and then the love of money? A closer look reveals that what we have here are power, sex, and money, three things that regularly intersect in the crossroads of injustice. How we love through hospitality, or rather the lack thereof, determines our relationships with power, sex, and money. Unhealthy understandings of power, the misuse of sex, and the love of money all stem from our own fears. We don't practice hospitality for fear that what we may need in the future, we just gave away to the needy. We don't remember and care for those in prison for fear that standing in solidarity with them runs the risk of taking on their hardship. We don't honor our marriages and keep it from adultery for fear that we are missing out on something better. We don't let ourselves be content with what we have and we continue to chase after money for fear of abandonment. But we can say in confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? You know, this rhetorical question in verse 6 implies that since people can't do anything to us, as God's adopted children, we can loosen our grip or loosely grip our money and other possessions. We can live a relaxed life that allows us to be hospitable and to stand in solidarity with those suffering from injustice. We can live in freedom instead of fear. We can live free to give of ourselves, our time, talents, and resources without the thought of how it might bring something in return. We can trust that the gifts we send out to places like Rahab Sisters or to the Episcopal Relief and Development are adequate 
and exactly right because God, who is the source of all things, is the perfecter of all things. And as I promise, Kate, I won't take too long this morning. I'll close with a reminder from theologian Stanley Grintz that it is only as God shares with us his own essence, which is love, that we are able to engage in the work of the triune God in the world. And so may the Lord continue to bless you and the Church of the Good Shepherd as you care for one another, building each other up, and practicing friend stranger until the fulfillment of God's kingdom. And I offer these words to God who created, sustained, and redeemed all things. Amen. Good morning. Hello, I'm Kate Altenhoff Long, and I am your Outreach Ministries leader here at Church of the Good Shepherd. Thank you, Desiree Eden, for coming today to speak to us. Rahab Sisters is doing important, valuable work supporting a vulnerable community in our world. Thank you for sharing with us. As part of my preparation to learn more about what Rahab Sisters has been doing recently, of course, I looked at the website and social media. Um, I was touched by a comment from a volunteer at Rahab Sisters on Facebook. This volunteer commented that her favorite aspect of volunteering at Rahab Sisters is the unconditional love and respect shown to all ladies who come to dinner. She enjoys being able to connect with the ladies using services as well as volunteers on a heart-to-heart -heart level, nourishing my mind, body, and spirit. I just thought that was really wonderful. I'm so thankful that a place like Rahab Sisters exists and flourishes in our community, and I'm grateful that Church of the Good Shepherd has chosen to support this worthy ministry for so many years. Outreach and connection to community have been part of Church of the Good Shepherd since the beginning. Having many caring, generous, skilled, and active members of the community as members of our church was grown in our DNA, as Tom says, from our growth as a small congregation here on the corner of 10th and Ellsworth. Having people volunteering and leading at the food bank, at Share House, at the YWCA, and having hosted Rahab Sisters, Open House Ministries, and Council for the Homeless, to name a few, at our spring teas in the past as we connected with local nonprofits and learned more and more about them and became not only supporters but advocates and volunteers. Of course, this knowledge and experience and connection was going to deepen our relationships and strengthen our commitments to walking and working together. Having many strong community partners is an honor. I am grateful to be able to learn more about these important agencies making a huge difference in our area. My job is not always fun, I'm not gonna lie. I get a bit sad about the need and the gaps in our society. What keeps me going is helping to connect people and helping to fill the gaps. I pray, come Holy Spirit, before I pick up the phone or as I'm trying to figure out how to help someone who has reached out. The Holy Spirit has not let me down yet. You could say I'm a fan of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if you would like to come and talk to me about any of our community partners, Share House, YWCA, Open House Ministries, Clark County Food Bank, Rehab Sisters, Good Shepherd Montessori, Ellsworth Community and, Re um, Ellsworth Community and Resource Center, and more, please come and talk to me. Oh, and one more, Council for the Homeless. Look for more information coming up about opportunities and events like the Council for the Homeless virtual luncheon October 20th and how you can be involved. Um, uh, there are a lot more places in the community and I know that you volunteer at more places and I would love to hear about those too. I'm looking to learn from you also. There are so many people at Good Shepherd who volunteer and who want to help our community. I am very proud of our church's policy to send out into the community 10% of any and all donations which come into our church. 
People are sometimes surprised to hear or to be reminded that our church donates to and supports so many agencies locally. Whether you're surprised or impressed or filled with joy to share or hope to solve a crisis or bring comfort to someone in need, I say, welcome to Good Shepherd. Thank you for supporting Outreach Ministries. <laughs>